Good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Prince Hall Think Tank, a monthly conversation amongst Prince Hall Freemasons, where we discuss topics relative to craft masonry. My name is Brother Antonio Caffey, and I'm a very proud past master of St. Mark's Lodge Number 7, located in Columbus, Ohio, where Worshipful Brother Royston Snowden serves as Worshipful Master. Mm -hmm. Our lodge was chartered in 1852 by the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Ohio, where currently the Honorable Jerry R. Ellison serves as Most Worshipful Grand Master. Before I let the other brothers introduce themselves, I would like to state that the views and opinions that are expressed by us this evening um, in no way reflect the views and opinions of the Grand Lodges and Lodges in which we all hold membership in. Also, if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to post them on our Facebook page or by using the chat option on our YouTube um, page. And while you're there, make sure you click like and, and uh, subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with all things think tank at this time i'll let the um our um brothers introduce themselves and then brother morgan will introduce our special guest this evening brother morgan good evening everyone um my name is james r morgan the third and i'm a proud past master of corinthian lodge number 18 which operates under the auspices of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. Uh, worshipful Master H. Donovan Colding is serving as my Worshipful Master. And we, we, we love the fact that we are operating masonry under the auspices of Most Worshipful Grand Master Anthony B. Corbett. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here, and I serve as the Grand Historian for the jurisdiction of the District of Columbia. Uh, I am thrilled always to be here on the Prince Hall Think Tank. And I want to kick it down to my brother down in North Carolina, Brother Damian Jack. Good evening, all. Uh, Brother Damian Jack, uh, proud past master of Paul Drayton Lodge number seven here in Charlotte, North Carolina, where Worshipful Brother Malcolm McClendon serves as our Worshipful Master. Our lodge is a constituent lodge under the auspices of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of North Carolina, where the Honorable Daniel L. D. T. Thompson serves as our 24th Most Worshipful Grand Master. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be before you, as always, this month, and looking forward to a great show. Uh, thank you, Brother Jack. Brother Morgan, could you please introduce our special guest this evening? I would be honored to do so. This brother is somebody who I've watched from a distance for quite some time uh, as he helped make Masonic history, and we're going to talk about that tonight with our topic. Uh, but I speak of none other than uh, Brother Troy D. Curtis. Uh, brother Curtis was raised as a Master Mason in William H. Scott Military Lodge Number 182 on May the 19th, 2012. Uh, so he so he's actually got a uh, got a Masonic birthday coming up this coming month. Yes, uh, he was awarded the 2014-2015 Master Mason of the Year Award for the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the state of Missouri. Uh, he was the Charter Worshipful Master for Moses Dixon Lodge number 187. Uh, as you can see that, he, he's very proud that he's got it on his shirt there, uh, in case you forget. Uh, he's a member of Eureka Consistory number 29 of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite. Prince Hall affiliation. Uh, he's a member of, of Medina Temple, number 39 of the Ancient Egyptian Arabic Order, Nobles of the Mystic Shrine. Uh, he is a proud member of the Phylaxis Society, and I might I add a contributor as well, I think I've read a couple of pieces of his. So if you, if you haven't read him, make sure you get in the Phylaxis Society, check out some of his brother's writing, all right? Uh, he currently serves as the elected Grand Chaplain of the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the state of Missouri. Uh, professionally, He's an ordained minister through the Spiritual Society of Amun Ra and, a found, and the founder of Living Sun Outreach Ministries. Uh, he authored the book, Coming Forth into Consciousness, Volume 1, The Enlightenment of the Neo-African, and has lectured at various churches, workshops, seminars, study groups, and conferences. So we got us a praying man here, and y'all seen how we act on the think tank. We need, when y'all know, we need prayer, so we got some prayer going on tonight. Uh, in his leisure hours, uh, Brother Curtis enjoys researching history, world religions, cultural anthropology, and genealogy. Uh, Brother Curtis, uh, welcome to the Prince Hall Think Tank. Uh, please, please, please say hello to, to, to the Think Tank universe out there. Good evening to your brothers and good evening to all of your viewers. Thank you so much for having me on the show this evening. I am truly, truly honored. <laughs> No, thank you. No, thank you, um, good brother, for, for being with us. Uh, we're very excited about the topic uh, this evening. You know, I, as I was thinking about this um, on my way back into town today, I thought if, if you think about it, you know, Freemasonry is being such an old institution. 
uh, many of us have really never experienced, you know, the creation of an actual lodge. Uh, you know, I know like many of you, by the time I joined the lodge, you know, we had our customs, um, traditions, all that had already been set. Um, the environment, you know, had already been created. And it, it, so it's just our job to maintain those things that have already been established and, you know, obviously uh, help improve upon some things. But, you know, to, to actually create a brand new lodge is, is really foreign to us. So tonight, you know, we're going to have Brother Curtis on uh, as we discuss what it takes to actually create a lodge. So take it away, Brother Curtis. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to take you through the journey uh, that began even but long before I became a Mason. Um, I'm going to thank three people specifically. And the first, this brother... This lot, Moses Dixon Lodge number 187 would not have happened without this brother's vision and foresight. And he is, I'm going to call him a brother, but he's actually a past master, brother Keith Hart, or past master Keith Hart from William H. Scott Military Lodge number 182. Now, years ago, he looked at our district and saw basically the writings on the wall that we were losing lodges, we were getting smaller. And he loves his district, he loves the state, and loves Prince Hall Masonry that much. He knew that we had to try to grow uh, the district as much as possible. So conversations began long before 2012 when I was raised. Now, fast forward to 2015. This has nothing to do, at 2015, I had been in for three years. I didn't know anything about the conversations about a new lodge. But I was at a lunch, uh, just a, a lunch get together with a brother who is who was a mentor to many and a friend to many, past Grandmaster Michael Trent Johnson. Um, this was 20, I'm sorry, 2014, December of 2014. This brother and I were at lunch and we were just casually talking because by me coming into the order, I was just learning about Moses Dixon. He was a great admirer of Moses Dixon. So we, you know, talk a little bit about it. And I said, brother, it would be great if we one day somebody had a lodge, created a lodge named after Moses Dixon. But again, I stress, knew nothing about the conversations of, a, of the possibility of a new lodge being needed. So now from 2014, and I have to say this, unfortunately, January 2015, past Grandmaster Michael Trent Johnson passed away and he never really saw the uh, those uh, talks come into fruition about a new lodge, but he was an outstanding brother. But fast forward to 2017, past Master Keith Hart, myself, and uh, at the time, worshipful Master Patrick Harris, who is a past master, but unfortunately, he has uh, recently passed away as well. We were taking care of, a of some Masonic business on a Saturday. After that business had concluded, we went to a Starbucks just to sit down and have a little ca a casual conversation. That was when Past Master Hart first told me about a new lodge. Past Master um, Harris, they had talked about it. The talk had been around certain people for a while, but I'm gonna say this jokingly, maybe foolishly or naively, I said, brother, I'll take it. No matter what, I'll take a new lodge to begin. That began the unofficial work, if you will in 2017. Now, I go back to Past Master Hart because then that brother did so much work behind the scenes to make this happen. Now, let's fast forward again to 2018. We ha I have to say Past Grand Master Henry Willis. He is real he's another architect for this lodge for the simple fact without his signature giving us this dispensation we would not have had the opportunity to prove ourselves to be a worthy lodge. So we were given our dispensation July 2018. And now this is where the challenges begin, brothers, because I'm going to say this. I was unofficially told, being the charter works for masters, said, brother, if you, if you brothers don't make this work, you will have difficulties getting back into your previous lodges. And I'm just going to be factual with you. A new lodge was needed, but it wasn't wanted by many people. 
Uh, some will admit it today that they, they didn't want a new lodge. They didn't want brothers leaving a certain lodge and going to another one. But a new lodge was needed to grow the district. So we faced an uphill battle. Um, the brothers, and, and quickly, before I go any further, I've got to shout out the brothers. The founding members of Moses Dixon Lodge. Of course, myself, you have Brother Durwood Jennings, who is a past master now. We have our worshipful master, Joseph Campbell. Thomas, Brother Thomas Donaldson, Brother Jamal Reed, Brother uh, Stevon Green, Brother Gerald Smith, Brother Tobias Keys, Brother Ronnie Hamilton. Those were the founding members of Moses Dixon Lodge, the charter members. Now, I also got to talk to, uh, uh, to our new brothers, Brother Justin Hoskin, Brother Royce Tobert, Brother Earl Miller, Brother Terrell Fisher, Brother Chris Davis, Brother DeMarco Terman, and Brother Ernest Jordan. Um, these brothers collectively have bought into the mission and the vision for Moses Dixon Lodge. And it was, as I stated in the beginning, from August to December of 2018, an uphill battle. But thankfully, prior to that, the brothers had a plan. Um, we had a plan. The brothers, they funded this lodge out of their pocket. A brother came up with an idea of a savings plan. Each brother would donate $10 a month to a savings plan so we could buy lodge furniture and take care of all of those necessities. OK, we, you know, and, and if it, if not for those brothers, we, um, you know, sacrificing their their own money, uh, personal money, we wouldn't have we would have had a much harder, much harder uh, ordeal attempting to get what we need. So the brothers had a plan first started with a savings plan. Uh, then we had to have, you know, there are three aspects to uh, uh, masonry that I, I've talked about. You have your ritual, your business and your charity, uh, the business aspect. You know, we had to have fundraisers. We had bills to pay. So we started with the fundraiser in August. Um, this is a simple fundraiser, but from July, we were given our dispensation. August, we started with the fundraisers. Now, the key to that, that fundraiser, again, we're talking about a plan. That fundraiser then enabled us to fund the first uh, Thanksgiving basket holiday, uh, holiday thanks, I'm sorry, giveaway, Thanksgiving basket giveaway during Thanksgiving. We were able at that time to feed five families. We gave them the entire full meal that they could prepare for themselves. Now, it may seem like not a lot, five, but that was huge for us to be able to assist. Since that, since that initial, that inaugural giveaway, we have fed maybe over 60 families in the city of Jennings, Missouri since that point. So again, the brothers saw the vision, they supported the mission, and uh, we just continually grew like that. Now, we also um, created what's called the Black Owned Support System or the BOSS program to where quarterly we would go into the community, find a Black owned business, advertise it and invite everybody from the community to buy and, and sell that business out for that day to give, you know, um, basically, um, what am I trying to say, uh, to acknowledge these businesses and to, to help them advertise, if you will. So that was a part of our charitable uh, program. Um, after that, we started getting some attention. I'm going to fast forward to the latter half of the first half of 2019. If I am not mistaken, no, that was the, we won Lodge of the Year one of these years, uh, 2018, 2019 or 2020, simply because of the work that we attempted to do. Now, here's what's key, though, uh, brothers. The reason what really set us apart Yes, we did our planning, but we had to utilize what we saw as Sankofa. We had to look back to what our Masonic ancestors did in the 1800s. What made them so so uh, important, so pertinent in the 1800s? You know, they took care of the community. You know, the times were different, you know, by, you know, let's call it extreme segregation or what have you. But it was because they looked after the community. We have an unofficial model that says our community first. We have to make sure that the people see us in the community working for the community before we can ask anything from the community. So um, something else we implemented, free back to school haircuts. We're still doing that. Now, every August, we provide free back to school haircuts. And these are the little things that have allowed us to get the um, notoriety, if you will, good or bad, however you want to look at it from a lot of individuals because we're trying to go out into the community and do what we can. And not only that, 
inspire other Masonic lodges to do some of the same work that our Masonic ancestors previously did. Um, we were chartered July 10th, 2019. Uh, and, and from there, you know, that's kind of, you know, where we are, where we are now, but nevertheless, it was an uphill battle. We had challenges. We faced those challenges as a lodge and we were successful, victorious, and, uh, you know, we're still fighting. So, uh, brothers, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, first of all, thanks um, for that. Because again, I think a lot of us may take a lot of those things for granted because again, come into pre-existing lodges that some of them are hundreds of years uh, old. So we just, you know, get in and the, the train has already started and we just hop aboard. But to really like, you know, craft it from the beginning, I like what you said earlier, um, and, and I wonder if we can have a quick conversation about that because, and that's, again, facing the reality of the situation. It can be uh, political when you're yeah. talking about starting a brand new lodge um, because for, 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 for some, you know, some brothers are be like, okay, well, why are you doing this? You know, if, if we have enough here. Um, well, instead of starting a new one, um, we have a defunct lodge. Why don't you take that turtle over and you know re up it? Because you know, so how how, how were you? And, and again, I think the point that you made too is excellent. Where you know that wise counsel was told to you, where it you know someone like you said, someone told you, hey, if this doesn't work, it's gonna be hard getting back into yes, your um, your lodge. So uh, how did you all, I guess, you know, maneuver around all of that, like within that environment? How, how did you all work around that? We did what we were supposed to do, and and, and it, it, it's like anything. We, we well, we went up uh, above and beyond. But again, we had a plan. We didn't just sit on our hands and, and open and close a lodge. You know, we had a plan, and, and the idea was we are going to do our very best. If our very best doesn't work, that's fine. We can have our consciences clear if we put forth put forth the best effort that we could that we uh, possibly can. But we we couldn't look at though that negativity, if you will, you know, um, we just knew we had a job to do and we did it very well. And, and, you know, it's not that I'm trying to brag on on anything, but I mean, we did an outstanding job. The brothers, once they saw a, 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 the, the results, you know, they started working even harder. They they have. Some of the brothers were slightly apprehensive because, I, you know, it's just human nature. In the beginning, they understood what was going on, but it hadn't been done in so long. They were slightly apprehensive in the beginning. But once we start, we hit the ground, we start the ball, started rolling. Uh, we just did the work. And, and let me give you an example. Um, the primary officers of the lodge, we met long before we even had a dispensation and we rehearsed opening and closing the lodge we rehearsed because we knew that we had to be the examples of leadership we had to be the walking examples of leadership in the lodge meaning you know if uh we're not having any books open guess what brother ain't no books going to be open in the lodge and i say that because i know that there are some lodges books are still open by primary members of officers of that lodge you know and that was something that uh if any of you brothers know um right worshipful therese beckley he's a past grand lecturer he was um assigned to be our overseer well that brother um he didn't take lightly to having a book open let's just say that and i say this jokingly now but uh, we worked hard to prove that we deserved to be a chartered lodge within the other lodges and it was so much untapped potential in the community i mean it was wide open all you have to do is have right intent and the right heart and get out there and do the work so that's what we did. Yeah, and, and before I like I'm, I'm sure James and Damien have some, some things to add to. One thing that I, I, I do want to point out as well, because you like you also you talk, you know, you talked about the uphill battle and the different things you have to go through and things like that. The easiest way to avoid all of that, and, and this is my opinion, and thus the reason why. I state the disclaimer at the beginning of each show because I'm not speaking for my grand lodge or a lodge. So this is, a, you know, Brother Antonio Caffey. Because we've seen this throughout history. 
that, okay, you know, I want to start my own lodge. I'm going to go, you know, start my own lodge. I'm going to go to McCoy, get the things that I need from a, you know, think standpoint, go to, go to, go to them find some place to meet and do it. You don't do it under, you know, a, a, a grand lodge or, you know, what we consider a grand lodge, you know, that's um, what we would consider maybe regular or whatever. You just you start your own thing. You all took it upon yourself. You saw the need, but you still, there were still steps that you all went through, the proper steps to do so. And, and, and I think, again, throughout history, we see those examples of, folks wanting to do that, but then they go outside or they step outside the um, um, the agree upon ways to do that. So that I applaud you all, um, you, you good brothers for doing that and taking those necessary steps. Can I make a comment with that real quick, please? Because yes, I, I know exactly, you're absolutely right with history. That key was a person might have gotten upset, gotten their feelings hurt, been expelled, and then they wanted to take the ball, their ball and go and do what they wanted to do. This was, again, a group effort, and that's what made this key. A brother had a vision, but this was really a group effort because that brother could have said, yeah, I want a new lodge. I think a new lodge should be in the XYZ uh, area, and he could have tried to become the Charter Worship Master. He didn't want any of that. He said, no, brother, you go ahead and do it. I just He just, want, he just understood the need. See, there's a difference between need and want. A lot of the egos will take the want. I want a new lodge. I want to do this, this, this. But this brother saw the need and said, no, we have to do this to make sure that we would be able to survive, you know, as a district. So he looked past his own personal need and said, you know, this is about the uh, greater good of the collective, not the individual. Excellent point. Um, brother Curtis, I have a question. So let's take, I want to take a step back for a second to, you know, um, after you said, you know, to the brothers that you got it, you were going to take this uh, and kind of make it your baby and, and, and work it out. Logistically, how did you assemble those founding brothers? I mean, did, 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 did all or most of you come from the same lodge? Did you put out an informational, you know, uh, flyer and say, hey, we want to start a new lodge and post it at the Grand Lodge website or something? I mean, how did you get that team of brothers together? And what was that? What, what was that like? Uh, that's that's difficult. Because there's it's still some hurt feelings about that, brother. I'll be honest with you. Um, I, I took part of that. Past Master Keith R. took the other part. And I chose uh, a group of brothers who were not officers, but let's say senior members of the lodge we were raised in. Okay, when I say senior, they came in around the time I came in or after. So they would not hurt the... Um, numbers the strength of the lodge that we came from our mother lodge but i picked a you know i picked a few brothers that were great brothers and um you know and there were a lot of great brothers so the decision was difficult but um you know i, I picked the brothers who had been in there almost you know um in a seniority basis almost uh and that was part of it past master Hart went out and searched for other brothers so we we didn't want to pull too many from the mother, mother lodge out of respect. So there were other brothers that he went and, uh, you know, basically asked if uh, they would be interested. So that's the it, we had to have somewhat of a balance right there. OK, Again, that was not easy, though, brother. Let me tell you. OK, very good. Well, well we understand. and Appreciate that. The other thing I wanted to get into t discussing, and this is kind of how uh, you all came to my attention a few years back. Uh, you know, Moses Dixon is someone who, you know, if you know anything about Prince Hall Masonry, uh, Moses Dixon, especially in the Midwest, Moses Dixon is a name that uh, should be known far and wide between Ohio, uh, Missouri, Kansas, Kentucky, Tennessee. I mean, his brother was all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, and I, was, I was very curious as to how you all came to adopt him, that name. So I think you kind of touched on it already. But can, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about of uh, who Moses Dixon was, what he means to your lodge. Was there is there any other aside from you all being a lodge in Missouri? Is there any other connection that you all have to him, you know, personally, or uh, you know, I don't I don't know if he lived in that area or not. But you know, was there any other connections to him? You know, as as you brothers know, Moses Dixon did almost everything. Uh, we know he was a minister with the um, African Methodist Episcopal Church. He was president of the St. Louis Refugee and Relief Board. 
he was the actual uh, founder of the International Order of the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, International Order of 12 Knights and Daughters of Tabor. But before that, for me, it was the Order of 12. That first organization that was secret, if you will, um, my dates are a little uh, incorrect. I believe 18, either 1847, 1852, where he and 11 other men met here in St. Louis, Missouri, I believe 7th and Green Street, downtown St. Louis, and where they actually formed that secret organization uh, to combat slavery. That right there inspired me alone. Now, my first personal um, exposure to Moses Dixon was simply the fact that he was the our first grand lecturer, uh, because I respect the position of grand lecturer a lot. I uh, used to think I wanted to be a grand lecturer, but you brothers do an outstanding job. But uh, I really was um, just impressed by that and the fact that he chartered, or he helped to charter, I should say, so many lodges within Missouri, without Missouri, outside of Missouri, as you brothers know. He was just a true workhorse. I believe he also wrote the uh, rituals for the her heroines in Jericho, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, brothers, please... Uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. And he hit so many things he had did. He, he accomplished for his community. And that's what's key. So many things he was willing to sacrifice for his community. And just that work that he put in, uh, we were just, we'd say it couldn't be anybody else that we would want to name our lodge after because there, to my understanding, may have been one lodge previously named um, for Moses Dixon, but it was only called Dixon Lodge. So I don't actually have the proof that it was for Moses Dixon Lodge, but thus far, it's a possibility only one lodge being named after him. So we said, let's take it all the way, naming Moses Dixon Lodge, give our brother the proper credit that he deserved. Now, here in Crestwood, Missouri, if you will, right, and this is all the St. Louis metropolitan area, is Father Dixon Cemetery. I don't know if any of you brothers have um, been there, but that's the final resting place of Moses Dixon. Uh, there's a Tekken or obelisk there as his uh, monument. And, um, you know, we started working with the cemetery, uh, Friends of Father Dixon Cemetery, doing volunteer work and really beginning to see the bigger picture of not just Moses Dixon, but the people that he influenced and inspired as well. So um, I could go on and on, brothers, but Moses Dixon was truly an anomaly within our history because not many people, in my personal opinion, have achieved so much that he he did yet uh, many people that they don't know about it now brother morgan you and i briefly spoke about the other day i was able to find living descendants of moses dixon recently once i contacted the family and, and i confirmed everything and and prayerfully i'm going to write an article and, and outline everything they knew nothing knew nothing of moses dixon had never heard of moses dixon outside of just being related to him Never heard of anything in, you know, the history books or what have you. And what's funny, right now, Moses Dixon's great, great, great grandson, great, 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 great granddaughter are living. Their father just happened to be a Prince Hall Mason in the state of uh, Michigan, at, in Detroit, Michigan. And he didn't know anything about his grandfather, his great, great grandfather. So, uh, you know, I'm, and I know I'm rambling, but there's so much we could talk about when it comes to Moses Dixon and his greatness. And now... The fact that he has living descendants, that is even more exciting, at least for me anyway, to know that, you know, this man has a living legacy that is still here with us. Hmm. Welcome. Welcome to what we call the rabbit hole. You sound like uh, you definitely sound like a lecturer to me. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, uh, and a good one. And a good one at that. We don't call that rambling. Uh, yeah. You know, that is the that is the thing that I have learned from. Uh, brothers Caffey, Morgan, and and, and Gillarm, and, and coming to uh, this show. Once you once you go down one one avenue and you find something, you end up going down so so many other avenues. So I think that's that's absolutely beautiful in understanding the the history and why you named the lodge uh, uh, appropriately. Um, yes. uh, what you named it, and, and in honor of uh, Brother Moses Dixon. My question for you, uh, Brother Curtis, is one of one of the things that we tend to uh many people tend to look over um is the process 
Uh, we look at, you know, the fact that you have uh, that you put in the work and create in creating uh, and, and building up a, a, a new lodge and people, uh, uh, they they see the they see the result of it. Um, they see that now you are a you're you're a charter member, you're considered a charter member and you will forever be on the, the, the roles you and the brothers that you have named will forever be on the roles as as charter members of of this lodge but what we tend to overlook uh as the as the the quote says uh people see your glory but they don't know your story so when we look at the when you look at the process of 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 what it took and of course there was work in the process but now now that the you know the process and when you define process as a series of actions and steps in order to achieve a particular end. This particular end was the, you know, developing the lodge. Now the lodge is is where it is. Can you take us, you know, through the some of the obstacles and, and hurdles that you had to deal with the process? And now that you have reached a particular end, you are now, uh, you know, an, an official lodge, you know, Moses Dixon Lodge number 187. Now the real work begins. So now what, you know, what do you do in order to make sure that the lodge get, you know, continues to continues to flourish and continues to to build upon the, the legacy and the process that you and the charter members have started? OK, well, let's start. I actually say the process, brothers. Um, And it's simple. Um, The petition for dispensation had to be submitted to the Grand Master at the time past Grand Master uh, Henry uh, Willis, you know, um. And again, he could have said no, but past master Keith Hart had dialogue with him, you know, convinced um, the past grandmaster of the work that we would be doing. And he said yes. So by the stroke of his signature, um, the petition for dis dispensation was accepted. So again, July 2018, let's move to August 2018. Now, you know, we are dealing with the business aspect of masonry as well. Uh, we may have not been a chartered lodge, but let's just say, and we had to prove ourselves again. So we willingly paid taxes to the Grand Lodge. Okay. Now we couldn't be issued a uh, checking account yet. So I'm going to say, and, and and I hope I'm not getting anything too too serious. But we were not a chartered lodge, so there was no such thing as a lodge checking account tied to a Grand Lodge. So. The bank account, and as worse for master, I took the responsibility because I felt like it was my, you know, responsibility to take any negative issues that would come, not those large brothers. I would take all of it. So our bank was a bank bag that I kept in my nightstand drawer full of money. We paid dues. We paid our biz, our bills with cashier's checks or money orders. And these, these little things that um, it... it it took a, how can I say, it, it was tedious, okay? But we had to, again, prove ourselves by, you know, operating as a chartered lodge. So we paid our taxes the way we did. We paid other bills the way we did. Um, we bought banquet tickets, let's just say that. Um, and and we, it was a lot of banquet tickets for a new lodge, brothers, let me just say that. But we operated within the parameters that we needed to as a chartered lodge uh, again you know there and, and i'm looking back i can see everything clearly with the history wise um august to december and i'm gonna uh, i'm stating that again that was everybody had to learn what they needed to do now mind you i had great past masters in the lodge three great past masters past master thomas donaldson past master Jamal Reed, past master Stevon Green. Those brothers were great counsel when things were needed as far as understanding how we needed to conduct certain aspects of business. Uh, but again, being a new charter lodge, no one had ever done this before. So, you know, we were all learning almost as we were going, but the basics were set up for us to operate. I mean, we knew we had to uh, have a meeting location. Oh man, let me, let's talk about a meeting location, brothers. That was probably one of the most difficult aspects of securing was a meeting. So if anyone is ever thinking about charting a new lodge, make sure you have a meeting location 
before those talks even started. And I say that jokingly, that was one of the hardest things because we wanted to be in the community. We don't have Prince Hall Masonry uh, collectively. We don't have the relationships with the black church like we did in the 1800s. OK, you know, we have some relationships. Don't get me wrong. And I say that to say those were former meeting places from time to time. Uh, we just don't have those relationships. So, you know, we're looking at community centers. We're looking at other locations to try to meet and, and you know, conduct our rituals and our business. Uh, that was one of the most hardest challenges, brothers, if you want to know, meeting location, meeting location, because we, New Lodge, we don't own anything yet. You know, we're working toward that goal, but a meeting location is the, a secure meeting location as, as well. You know, it's it sounds like it's trivial, but that was a very, very difficult task. But fast forwarding now to what, what the legacy that we want to maintain. One thing that I see, I, I noticed that when lodges, established lodges have issues, I try to make sure that I'm paying attention to those issues and I'm sharing those issues with brothers because it will inevitably happen to this lodge. You know, we're riding on, you know, uh, victories on the tails of victories right now, but human nature is going to come sooner or later. And, and those trials are going to come sooner or later. But if you observe and you try to be as proactive as possible to prepare yourself, you can at least maybe cushion that you, you, you're not going to eliminate issues, but you can try to prepare for them a little bit better so that, you know, your legacy can strive and or thrive a little bit longer in, in positivity and not negativity. Because as you brothers know, it takes one, one bad member that can destroy the morale of a lodge or that can just uh, influence the lodge negatively. So I'm just saying as far as legacy, we want to examine every aspect of masonry by successful lodges by lodges that are having issues and say, what is it that we need to do or not do to continue this positive legacy of Moses Dixon? And, and can, can I piggyback on that? I'm curious to know, how did you ultimately resolve the issue of uh, the meeting location? Did you all meet at the community center? Did you start meeting at an established lodge building? Like what, what did you all do to, uh, to, to get Dean to and right uh, we were in a, a, a predominantly black community. There were some good brothers. I have to call out Brother Earl Miller. At the time, he was um, the exalted ruler of the local Elks Lodge in that in that area. I asked that brother. I said, "Brother, we need to meet. We're doing this, this, and this." He did not hesitate to say, "Brothers, come on." He was not. He's not a founding charter member, but uh, he came and demitted into our lodge later on. But that brother saved us. Let me say this. And I have to acknowledge that he saved us. Now, we had a few ebbs and flows, uh, you know, from time to time to where we are now, just because things happen. But initially, we found a location at an Elks Lodge and it saved us. And that's that's where I where we really began um, to get our feet planted, to get our foundation and for everybody to say, OK, it's time to get to work. Uh, and then, you know, later on, we found a different location. But uh, that's where we started. And it's funny, uh, another fraternal organization helped us out. Well, but you know, you know what? I, I think it's interesting. It, it, you say it's funny, but historically, that's one of those kind of connections that I think that you talked about that's kind of been frayed over the years, right? I mean, historically, mm -hmm. uh, when you think about, we, we, we often have this idea that every Prince Hall Lodge was meeting in a lodge, or maybe, like you said, maybe an AME church. But there was a historical connection of having the Odd Fellows, the Elks, the Masons, you know, all these different organizations meeting in a same in, in the same spaces. So that's not when you look at the the the, the broad scheme of, of of Black fraternal history. That's really not that that far out of the ordinary. It just maybe out of the ordinary, you know, for 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 today. Um, I'm going to pass on to another brother, but I do want to say uh, shout out to uh, Brother Jamal Reed in your lives. I was laughing when you said the name because. In my lives, we have a past master, Jamal Reed, who was actually my sponsor. Is so that my, right? My voucher to get me in Main Street. So when you said the name, I kind of did a double take. I said, "Wait, is that what he's been doing? He's been, he been uh been moonlighting. He's been doing uh, the Fred Flintstone, going going from DC to Missouri." So I'm, 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 I'm gonna talk to past master Reed when I catch him. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I mean, and, and just right quick, just to stay on that subject too, because you know, masonry um, is one of those unique paternal organizations when it comes to meeting space. Mm -hmm. and, and and the things that we require um, 
or that we're required to have um, during our meetings. So, you know, like you said, it just can't be, you know, someone can give you the greatest space in the world, but if it's not conducive to um, masonry, it, it, exactly. it, it won't work. So I can really imagine how that would be probably the toughest um, thing because then, and, and, and then also too, looking at the politics of it, you know, where those other lodges are meeting at, you probably can't, <laughs> you probably can't meet there. So you have to find exactly. this, exactly. this, this other new space. So no, that, that's, I, I can, I can definitely see that good brother. And yes, I sir. would definitely say as, you know, you know, as you are now, uh, uh, making history that, that, that point, you know, that was made that you initially met and, you know, in the Elks Lodge, I think that's a, a definite and uh, important point in history, you know, mm. so, you know, prayerfully, of course, uh, you know, you brother Curtis being, being a writer, um, you know, hopefully as you continue to write down the history, you can, you know, write that connection, but, you know, yes, sir. how, you know, the, you know, the Elks helped the, you know, the Masonic Lodge build, you know, into, into what it is now, because I think that's, you know, sometimes when, you know, when history is, is, is written, there, there are a lot of uh, important points that are, that are missing. That can help you know you know connect the dots so a very important point in history yes sir yes sir brother curtis i, I you know I'm, I'm struck because you know you are one of few brothers that i've come in contact with that has had the opportunity to serve as a uh pillar officer let alone the worship master of a lodge at its foundation um and and i'm curious you know uh since we have this wondrous technology that, that, that Brother Moses Dixon didn't have back in his day. Uh, I'm curious, you know, if you would let us know, you know, if you were to talk to a new brother or maybe even the worshipful master of Moses Dixon Lodge a uh, hundred years from now, if he was to come back on YouTube to, to watch the Prince Hall Think Tank, and I think we'll, we'll still be rolling by that time, you know. There you go. Uh, we, we, we're going to be, we're going to be, we might be in like our 110th season, but we're still going to be rolling. Um, what message would you want those brothers to, to, to walk away with from your lips to their ears, uh, what, what's the thing that you hope that they, you know, would, would kind of uh, take into the future? Be seen in your community. And I'm going to give you an example. Um, the last year, possibly, Moses Dixon Lodge participated in a back to school jamboree for the local school district in, in Jennings, Missouri. And uh, past master Derwood Jennings, I believe he was still in the chair at the time. Um, you know, they had the live shirts on. They were doing the work. There was an, uh, an elder brother there, I don't know, in his 80s or 90s. Um, and he said, huh, I didn't know you Prince All Masons were still around. Now, this is a brother who's in his 80s and 90s and who knew of Prince Hall Freemasonry. But I guess since he may have not seen or heard anything about Prince Hall Freemasonry, he thought we were gone. We're no longer active. That's one example. Be seen in your community doing doing work. We utilize social media for a specific, re specific reason. This upset a lot of other people as well because they thought we were showboating. No, we were promoting the works of Prince Hall Maestri through our lodge to let people know we are a charitable organization. We're out here working for the community. So be seen. And I'm going to give you another example. Now, dur during the Ferguson uprisings, um, there were one day many of us were down there helping out, directing traffic, what have you, just watching over people. A uh, brother had a Prince Hall shirt on. There was a sister. She said, who is that? And he began to tell her. She said, huh, I thought that was just the name of a building over off North Newstead. Over here in St. Louis, we have a building that's not affiliated with Prince Hall Freemasonry named after Prince Hall. That's the only thing she knew about Prince Hall. So again, if I were to tell anybody, be active, be seen in your community, you know you are of the community, so go give back to the community. Let them know who we are. Inspire these men and women, especially these young men, with your work that you're doing for them. So that would be my message to anyone 100 years from now. I, I hope that makes sense there. And and that's what I mean. And I know we you know we we often I guess talk about or disparage um, the word recruitment, but mm -hmm. that's how we recruit by our works, not necessarily going on, hey, you want to be amazing, but but right. our work um, attracts those those like-minded men that 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 want 
to become um, Masons. They have to see you and know about you in order to want to, you know, be a part of. Yes, sir. Crab. So absolutely, it's, it's, it's I believe it was. Work. I believe we, you know, we just I was just talking about in a presentation that I did earlier this week. You know, the difference between. The, the the business of masonry versus the work of masonry. I believe it was a, a a good brother by the name of James R. Morgan III who said that sometimes we we get lost, we lose Freemasonry doing the work, doing the business of Freemasonry. You know, so you know, and 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 a lot of times we get so lost in in the business that we forget about the work and understanding what the the work of Freemasonry is. And and you know, as Brother Curtis says, you're talking about you're talking about the work, you know, the the, the actual work um, that it takes to, you know, to promote, you know, Freemasonry, you know, it's just more than just, you know, handling the, you know, the business or, you know, fish fries and tickets and, you know, things like that. There's actual work that, you know, that has to be done. So um, definitely a applause to you for, for the things that you're doing. Thank you, bro. Thank you. James, I see our... our chat is, is jumping once again tonight uh, so i'm sure we have some questions um from from our audience so again um if you have any questions please feel free to ask uh we we, we, we definitely do i want to get, definitely give a shout out to all of the brothers and sisters and viewers in the prince hall think tank universe out there uh you know i i, I could see my, my main man tommy van buren he said jurisdiction of arkansas is in the house maine so it was a shout out to the <laughs> grand historian Tommy Van Buren out there in Arkansas, yeah. the, 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 good, the good brother. Um, yeah. Let me see. Here. So we, we do have we do have a couple of questions actually that have come through, um, and a couple of interesting comments. Uh, brother Mark Rainwright said that this is awesome. He's the senior warden of a lodge in Maryland, and he was senior warden when that when that lodge received their dispensation and charter. So that's good to know that Moses Dixon Lodge isn't the only recent lodge uh, out here doing. Uh, uh, doing this work and, and getting getting themselves established in the history of Prince Hall uh, Freemasonry, and also I think I see uh, we see Worshipful Master Joseph Campbell from Moses Dixon Lodge Number One Eighty Seven is in the house as well. So so I guess so I'm, I'm guessing the beard is must be a thing in Moses Dixon Lodge. That, that must be, you know, you, you, the beard and the bald heads, brother. I'm telling you, <laughs> got you. Every uh, lodge, every lodge has a prerequisite. <laughs> There you yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. And right. then the extras add the grade. Then you got it made. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Let's see. So we have a question here, which is let me see from Bashir Jenkins says, I'm a product of Masons who are visible in the community. If you're not visible, how can one ask one to be one? Mm. That's, that's, a, that's a that's a yeah. that's a good that's a that's a that's a that's a bar right there. I mean that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. that absolutely. Sense. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, it, look. Uh, Brother Jenkins gave us something to grow on with that one. Yeah, um, for sure. You know, um, let me see. So, Brother Van Buren asks, "Do you think that there are a lot of lodges being chartered in the twenty first century?" No. I mean, let's look at a comparison to the eighteen hundreds and nineteen hundreds to now. That's I. That's you know the standard that I'm using. And no, I mean. The majority seem to be have seem to have been charted. I mean, Moses Dixon charted lodges, <clears throat> Tennessee, I think Louisiana. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble by saying Iowa and Kansas, but you know, around the country, you know, he helped to charter lodges for Missouri that became Grand Lodges themselves. So there were many, many lodges chartered. Then now, just I guess that's why we're having this show, brothers, because it's such such a rare instance now that you know uh there's just not a lot of information about it yeah, and, and and i think if you look at you know what brothers are doing um and, and they've been doing it for years actually you know, maybe centuries in europe where they have like um and you see that you know in some uh within american freemasonry somewhat to sometimes you'll have those specialty lodges um where you'll have brothers get together that that you know they have a, a similar interest you know and they build the lodge around you know still keeping um with masonry but they build it around that interest and then they attract men who you know again those similar 
is that they want to be Masons and they also have that similar interest as well. Um, so I, 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 I think, you know, because when it comes to, and I think Brother Curtis, you, you would, which what, what you just said was true. Like when we were forming these lodges, I think one, it was out of necessity. Prince Harvey Masonry was, you know, in, in its infancy stage and it was growing. So now we're, we're, where we're at now and we still need to grow, but I think we need to use maybe a different model than we did in the beginning because the circumstances are different now, Yes, you know, so you still have the need to grow, but, you know, maybe looking at it from, uh, a different vantage point, you know, so. And I'd like to touch on one thing. Um, economics has played a huge key, especially in the rural areas. Now, I'm not sure, uh, you know, if you're, you know, in, in your respective uh, jurisdictions, but we have a large rural, rural area to where, you know, jobs are not there. So people had to move from small towns where we had numerous lodges at one point of history, these black men moved from those small towns into the large cities, if you will, looking looking for work. So unfortunately, there are still a few brothers and sisters left in these small towns. So how do we get that interest where they are? You know, I can name a couple of uh, small cities here, towns in Missouri that, you know, we could try to put some attention to. For example, Hannibal, Missouri. We had a uh, Masonic home in Hannibal, Missouri, but now there's no Masonic um, footprint there at all. You know, but there's still brothers and sisters, if you will, you know, uh, a population in Hannibal, Missouri that possibly could be interested. So there's work to be done. But again, economics is so key in this day and time. You know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. it's going to take money. You know, again, I state the three aspects, your ritual aspect, business aspect, charitable. You need all three to operate equally to have a successful lodge. You can't have too much charity because you'll run out of money. You can't provide too much business. You won't be able to practice your ritual properly, et cetera, et cetera. So it unfortunately does take a certain amount of financing with this. So, and and, and I so, think too, and you, I'm sorry, Giants. And, and you, again, yeah. looking back at history, it's gonna our our leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, which I'm sure, and and I'll say this. They, I'm sure they see a need in obviously growing, you know, the craft. But again, if, if I think the model that when they say, okay, let's grow the craft, it's like, okay, our lodges need to, our, our existing lodges need to grow. Instead of exploring that, like, hey, you know, we may have had, like you said, Brother Curtis, a, a, um, a footprint in this lodge, you know, years ago, and we don't have it now. There's still, you know, a, 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 you know, some some potential uh, membership there. So how do we do that? You know, okay, yeah, we do have two or three lodges in this city, but you know, what if we do have a new lodge? And it's it's because new lodge will bring in new energy yes. as well. You yes. know, because those brothers are working, they want to see it succeed. Um, they know that what they're doing today is not only benefiting the the, the, the membership of today, but you know. 50, 60 years from now, they're gonna, they're building the foundation for those future brothers as well. Mm -hmm. So, but I think a, a lot of it also can start with the, uh, the leadership and, and having that, that vision of growth, but a, a different vision of growth. Mm. Yes, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. And then that kind of leads into uh, so a couple of questions that we have here from the audience. And, uh, but I think you're going to really be, uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear your, your, your responses to. Uh, one of them comes from Brother DJ Square Business. He asks, is masonry as relevant in the, to the black community as it was during Reconstruction? Um, I think you kind of touched on that already, but then he has an interesting ele element here where he says, does our dual membership and other organizations rob our involvement in masonry due to conflicting commitments? Are we are we too busy as a society today, uh, uh, Brother Curtis, to 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 fully dedicate ourselves to our Masonic work? Uh, whether well, it be, you know, uh, mm -mm. that's interesting that you say that. And, and let's go back to the 1800s briefly. Prince Hall Freemason was among several fraternal organizations. Am I correct, brothers? Because I know I'm sure. talking to historians. Okay, but we survived. It seemed we survived better than the majority, like the Oddfellows, the Elks, etc. So for what what 
what was it that made us go run to the forefront? I believe even the Shriners, when they were when they first started, they weren't as strong as let's say they are now. So something about Prince Hall Freemasonry was able to take the forefront and run with the, if you will, the leadership of fraternal organizations. Now, of course, I'm not um counting or including collegiate fraternities right now, but just you know, the the the, the um older fraternal organizations. What is it that made us so popular and that we were able to survive? Now, with that aspect, um, it, it goes back to look at society. Now, what can we offer society? I don't believe that we're trying to reinvent the wheel to where it's something so great, so magical that we can provide for the community. But if we can just give attention to some of these young brothers, and I stress the free back to school haircuts, we get these single mothers bringing these boys in here that don't see black men organized like they see us often. So it's key that we just provide these small steps for the community. So I'm going to say, yes, we are needed in the community, but it's up to us. And, and, and I'm a broken record, brothers, but we've got to get back out there. We've got to create new ways. We can't just sit on our behinds and, and, and expect people to come to us, expect people to donate buy tickets buy those fish plates unless we are able or to take the first steps and go to the community and at least do something for them i hope that answers the question okay bro absolutely yeah. and i and i and i think i want to you know touch on the the aspect of you know dual dual membership and and the conflicted commitments if you look at our if you look at our brothers you know um our, an our ancestors, you know, uh, just for example, um, a couple of months ago, we did uh, we did a show on who our favorite Prince Hall Mason was. And when we look at um, when we look at some of our uh, favorite Prince Hall Masons, Prince Hall Masonry, while they used it as a platform to the to the best of their ability, they had other platforms that that they were using, you know, mm -hmm. for example, you know, I did uh, on brother, you know, Charles H. Wesley. He was he was president of, of of multiple colleges. He, you know, he taught, he, you know, he preached. He, you know, he belonged to this organization, that organization. So it wasn't, uh, you know, necessarily uh, a thing where there was co conflicting commitments. He knew how to use his time. Mm -hmm. And at the same, at, at the same time, I, I believe, especially, in, in today's in today's age, a lot of us are going to where we feel appreciated versus where we feel tolerated. I think you have. I think for in in, in a lot of uh, you know in a lot of organizations, you you know you put your time, you you invest your time in, and some feel that you know what I've exhausted my time here, so now I'm going to put my time in here and be you know because of that you know yes. Uh, a lot of a lot of the times wherever you put more time in that, you know, that other organization is, you know, is losing out for um, for whatever for whatever reason. Uh, but we, I think we have to understand that it's not necessarily a thing of, you know, conflicting commitments is where do you choose? Where do you choose to put your time in? Why do you choose to, you know, to to put your, you know, to put your time in that? Because all of us, all of us wear many hats. We have multiple hats. You know that we wear some favor wearing uh wearing one hat more than another you know you know we was just talking before we got on before we got on the air not not many noticed but I, i'm going to say if you look at you know the creator of our show brother kathy brother kathy just just drove in from charleston west virginia doing the work of another organization that he he is a part of but he's still putting his time into you know into this and what then what he's doing and and that is the work so where is you know so where is it that you are deciding to 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 put in in, in your time where is it that you feel that you are appreciated for the work that you do because no we're not doing the work you know to be acknowledged but all of us know that when you when you're appreciated for the work that you do it makes you want to do more work at, you know, at the end of, you know, at the end of the day. So um, we look at our, our brothers in history and we look at the so many things that that they have done and we do a microcosm of what of what they did 
you know, back in the day. So I think it's, it's one of those things where we can we can continue to grow. And even with all the, the, the organizations that that are out there now, yes, you have the, you know, the, the collegiate, you know, fraternities, which three of us belong to. You have the 100 black men. You have the, you know, you have the boule. You have you have all these, you know, or, organizations. And we still have it. Right. And we still haven't. We still haven't even talked about, you know, the church. So you still have, you know, you know, all of these organizations that, you know, that that are out there. But what you're you're going to put in to the forefront, what means the most to you. And like you keep saying, you know, Brother Curtis, and, and even though it's a you know, it's a broken record or something that needs to be said um, often. One of my one of my uh, instructors said that if you want to continue to make to maintain in the conversation, you have to be relevant. And yes. you get you've given so many examples on why we are not relevant. So at what point do we can, you know, do we get back to the point where we are relevant? You know, and I think that will change the dynamic of the organization and grow uh, you know, the numbers that you know we say are declining. Okay, I, I want to add some on to that. I agree with everything that, bro, that Brother Jack was saying, but I also want to add, add another element, too, to answer your question. You said, why? what was it about Prince Hall Macy that helped it survive better than a lot of other kind of contemporary organizations? Um, well, one, I think, you know, Prince Hall Macy was older, but the, the big thing I've always kind of considered, um, going back to one of my previous questions, is I think branding. I think I think that branding of organizations is so important. And I think that the brand of free of being a Freemason, being a Prince Hall Mason at one time meant a certain thing mm -hmm. that it doesn't necessarily mean in 2023. Mm -hmm. Now, it may still hold some weight, but I think that, that that understanding what that brand is, what that signifies when a man walks in the room and says, I'm a Mason, when a sister walks in and says, I'm an Eastern star, that signifies something sometimes positive and sometimes negative. Same thing with any other organization I think you may be affiliated with. But I think that we have to do uh, the best job we can of managing the brand of whatever organization it is that you're a part of, whatever church or mosque or what have, whatever it is that you belong to. And that way you become the best ambassador in your family and in your community for whatever it, it, it is that you're, that you're into. Um, if, you're, if, if you go back and look at how the brothers and sisters of the past manage the brand of Prince Hall Freemasonry, I think it goes back to what Brother Curtis was saying, that they were visible leaders in their community. And back then, I mean, if you go back to the, the, the 1800s, you know, you won't see a lot of, you won't see them wearing Masonic hats and all those different type of things because they were so well known in their community by and large that it was understood that, hey, those folks over there are doing something special. They're into something that's, that's, that's real deep. And maybe I can get in, maybe I'm not with it, but I know that they're doing something, right? That is, and, and, and heck, the lodge itself, the building used to be a community center before we had access to the public community centers, right? So, so, so not only, so, so literally taking your building, if you have one, and turning it into a beehive, into a hub for your community uh, work. You know, I'm very proud whenever I see a Masonic lodge um, being utilized for voter, um, for, 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 the, for elections and whatnot, that's another gateway of people to get in. If your lodge is open to having private events or what have you, that's another way if people say, oh, what, what's this building about, right? What are, these, what are these people doing here? You know, and, and there's a no, number of other examples, but I think managing the brand of your lodge and of your jurisdiction, of your organization as a whole is so important. I think we miss out on that. That's why I asked about that shirt earlier, because I, in my view, if I, if I had my way, every lodge, every chapter, whatever, would have their own unique shirts and brand and th just things of that nature to kind of show that you're alive and you're in the 21st century, not stuck way back when we were founded. Can I make one quick comment on that, brother? Please. Um, you're absolutely right. Years ago, I was the uh, chairman for what we call our schools of instruction in the 5th Masonic District. And when we had Newton brothers to come in during their EA and uh, fellow craft degrees, I would tell them that every Prince Hall Mason is a vanguard or is the vanguard for Prince Hall Freemasonry. So what did I mean by that? Don't go into the tavern with your light on acting a fool. Don't go into the strip club with light on acting a fool. Do not pr uh, promote us in that light because that begins the degradation of the brand or the character of Prince Hall Freemasonry. And unfortunately, I can't say for you brothers, but I've seen clowns come in and 
basically make us look bad because they've got that light on and they're someplace doing something that they don't need to be. And guess what? There are already rumors about Prince Hall Freemasonry's out there anyway. So now you have a brother who is feeding fuel, you know, to, you know, for that fire of the negativity that some people already have about Prince Hall Freemasonry. And, and, and bro, you, you triggered something there because I hadn't thought about that in a while. But that that's something that I was very adamant about. We are vanguard, so we need to act like that. We need to be the walking and living examples of what we claim to be when we come in here and take these obligations and when we put this time in. And unfortunately, that can either build that brand or take it from you. And Brother Curtis, you and you had listed all the the chartering members of your lodge um, near the beginning of the show. And how, how, how many brothers again? Uh, let's say, let me just give you a quick count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let me say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We had about nine, it looks like. Okay, so you had nine brothers that started this lodge. And, and, and the reason why I wanted to make sure, that's, that's what I, I thought. You, but sometimes I think when we have conversations about, you know, the state of Prince Arthur, you Masonry, the state of Masonry, we have, you know, you know, we need to get more and more people in and we get we start looking at these numbers. And 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 we need to have the realization that, you know, you don't need a lot of people and a lot of brothers to do the work. That's right. You don't. You 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 just need that those committed those committed brothers. Exactly. And so I think when we if and if we truly look at what Freemasonry is, and I always say like, you know, don't get me wrong. And I'm, I'm in the world of social service, so I, I, I know the poor importance and I respect the importance of community service, self-help, and all of that. But at its core essence, Freemasonry is meant to teach people about themselves and their relationship to, mm -hmm. you know, their God, their community, um, and their, their fellow man, you know, to make brothers better. So who, that's, in my opinion, is always going to be attractive to someone. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the reason why we focus on numbers sometimes is, and it's it, getting back to what Brother Jack had said earlier, and we had had the conversation about as far as there's that business aspect of Freemasonry where, you know, we need, you know, X amount of members means, you know, X amount of dues, and then we need to do this, and we need to do that, and and and. and, and you know, we need that, you know, that income. So we start, unfortunately, looking at these classes that are coming through as fundraisers almost, <laughs> um, which is uh, when you go down that road, it's, 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 it's a road to nowhere. So I, I think we need to, you know, it's almost reshaping our mind to fit today's time. Like, okay, we want to attract, it, it's the old quality over quantity type of thing, but I think Freemasonry will always appeal to those that you know we seek it and 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 we can't measure that and shouldn't measure that in my opinion by the numbers because as, as you know brother curtis just said it you had nine brothers that came together to form this bond and it's doing great work so and that's going to attract other um, men yes, that that want to you know join that and it doesn't have to be you know 15 10 or 100 or whatever it's going to be, you're going to get the, you know, we want to attract the right men into the organization. We want to attract the right women into the Eastern Star. Yes. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we want to take one more question? Yeah, sure. let's do it. Okay. All right. So uh, here, here's one that, that I think is going to be a bit of a doozy, but uh, for DJ Scribbins came back and asked, much like churches, there are lodges that struggle with membership and finances largely due to the sheer number of lodges in a given area. Should Prince Hall Lodges in this situation merge together? <laughs> oh, boy. The well, views well, and I, opinions I, I, are I, expressed by us. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, well I, I, I'll bite. I'll bite. I, you know, this is just my, my personal opinion. You know, I think that I tend to be somewhat of a uh, like a Darwinist when it comes to this type of thing. It's like you know survival of the fittest uh, when it comes to lodges and organizations. Now that's not to say if you have a lodge that's struggling or an organization that's struggling. And I'm and I, I'm a member of uh, 
I would say a, a, one of my Masonic organizations, I would say, is struggling. Um, I do think that there is leeway. I think there's grace. I think there's give them a chance to get it together and try to figure it out. Um, and if you're able to turn it around, if you're able to kind of get some new energy and whatnot, and like and as was just stated, it doesn't take a whole lot of people. I think we have to get back to thinking about what does success look like in the first place, right? Um, then you know, then you move forward. You know, if if merging is something that an organization wants to do with another one that's in the area, then that's you know up to them uh, or to that grand body. Um, but my biggest thing is you got to think about what does success look like for some. Success may just be, hey, look, we pay the bills, we have some nice events, we, you know, and, and it's only it's only ten of us here, but this, but this, but th- these ten are dedicated, and we show up. For some people, that may not be enough. Some people may say, hey, we need, you know, I want fifty brothers in this lodge and fifty sisters or whatever. Okay, you know, hopefully you're doing things to keep those people engaged, but you have to be able to, at the bare minimum, meet the requirements of whatever it is that your grand you know, jurisdiction um, requires of an organization to continue to exist. Um, and and if, you, if you're not doing that, then hopefully, you, you know, you, you turn it around. That, 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 that's just, you know, I hope that was a, I hope that was a PC answer. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. <laughs> I'm gonna no, stay know, away I think, from that answer, I'm gonna stay away from that question, brothers. Yeah, yeah. no problem. <laughs> no, I, I, I think, you, but James, I mean, to what you're saying, in all seriousness, I think you hit it on the head. It, 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 it may not. It, it, that may be the answer for a particular situation, you know, in a particular area. I, I think in order to make that decision, you need a realistic um, view of what's going on, um, and then you know, with an assessment of what's going on, and then what the um the best route to go and not do it automatically okay you know we need to do this so let's and, and not put any thought needs to go into but i think brother curtis laid it out perfectly at the beginning as far as all the thoughts that went into creating the lodge before you know the process even started you know if, if we want to be successful you need to put time and thought in, in into things to see if this is the best route to go and like i said for some areas that may be the best route to go in other areas it, it may not so just if, if i don't think there's not going to be a cookie cutter approach um to the situation even within this even within um a jurisdiction depending on the area it may be a different answer you know again brother curtis alluded to um the more rural areas that may exist within a jurisdiction okay the answer there may be different than you know a metropolitan city so again we just need to be mindful of putting time into okay if we want to be considerate of this let's truly study it so that we can make the best decision for the the brothers and for the community as well and you know ultimately for prince Arthur. absolutely and if i could add one more thing to that i will say this you know, I can think of at least two examples in, uh, in, the, in the immediate DMV area uh, of lodges that I know that once struggled. Um, uh, Shelton D. Redden 139 in Maryland, which is right here by my house, actually, and uh, John F. Cook number 10 in, in the jurisdiction of D.C. And this is going back to even before I was in Masonry. But my understanding is that both of those lodges at different points struggled. And the the they both have since turned around since those times. And the guiding stream between both of them um was told to me by one of the past masters of shelton d redden lodge he said brotherhood he said that, that the brothers of that lot of, of his particular lodge uh they sat down i think john of cook kind of did this as well and they said hey particularly the past masters but the brothers sat down and said hey we want to turn this lodge around we don't want to merge we don't want to give up a chart or anything what are the things we need to do we need to stop doing this stop doing this stop doing that and we need to start doing certain things so I know, for example, and it's not, and this is not anything. Um, I think that is, um, you know, uh, uh, particularly special that can't be done anywhere else. Let me say it like that. But I know John F. Cook Lodge, for example, those brothers every year they go on vacation together. Every year they say, "Hey, look, we're going down. We they, they got a brother who's got a house in Miami somewhere or wherever they're going, and they say, hey, look, we're going, we're going down here.' And some so years maybe they they're don't." Going, <laughs> they don't confine Freemasonry to the lodge. Correct. They 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 practice that brotherhood that we learn in the lodges 
right. in our lodges outside of the lodge. Right. Right. So so and that and and again, and that's not even something that they do. They don't that like I don't I don't I don't think I've ever seen them do, put up a a flyer anywhere and say John F. Cook Lodge is doing this and that. They just as the you know they of their own money, their own time. Boom, we're going out here. You know the uh the the brothers of SDR. I know that they they'll, they'll do things where they say, hey, look, we're all going. At, we're going to have a lodge. You know, a lodge date night. You know, everybody bring your wife, bring your girlfriend or whatever. We're all going to go here, and it's not necessarily a big to do. But how can we be brothers and sisters? How can we call ourselves a family if we're not doing the things that family and friends actually do That's outside right. of just the, the lights and camera of a program? Let's actually socialize and get to know each other and be, you know, so, 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 so doing things like that. I mean, hey, you know, when is the last time? I mean, in, in some lodges are different, you know, some lodges may be better at, hey, let's let's all get together and watch the football game that's coming on. Let's all go over here or, or, or something that I'm sorry, uh, brother Jack, I'm going to say this. I'll I'll pass it to you. Um, You know, do you have a, this was something that was just given to me. I think this morning, that was an idea that I thought was amazing. Do you have a calendar as a part of your organization's calendar events? When people's sons and daughters are having basketball games, volleyball Mm -hmm. games, swimming competitions, lacrosse, like those type of things. So the brothers and sisters of your organization can come support. And you can support their, you know, those type of things really help to build out that 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 membership experience. I think outside of just the confines of a meeting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, brother Jack. Go. Oh no, Please. you're fine. I mean, just piggyback off of you know what you're saying. You know, it reminds me of um, uh, one of the one of the books that you um, that 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 you promoted and and I happened to to read uh, the newly made Mason by H. L. Haywood, and you know he you know he talked with you know within that book you know, what a Masonic community, you know, uh, used to be, you know, in the days of, of, you know, operative masonry, when they, you know, when the masons would go and, you know, start to build before they even get to the point, you know, of building, they would establish, you know, they would establish a, you know, a, a community, you know, um, they would do, not only would they work together because the work that they did, they had to trust each other. So, you know, they would they would go to, you know, church together. They would they would eat together. They would do, you know, all these things together. So if a, if a brother's uh, if a brother or that brother's family was sick, they, you know, they they took care of each other. Now it's, you know, you know, to the point where, you know, a lot of that, you know, uh, it seems lost within, you know, speculative Freemasonry, you know, not, you know, uh, unless it's by coincidence, we know, you know, some of us don't, you know, live you know, live near each other, you know, the, the, the lodge was the staple in, you know, in, in the community. So it's like, you know, we only see each other, you know, once or twice a month and we don't have that, you know, that, that staple as, as, you know, being a family because we, we come together for a couple of, you know, for a couple of hours and then, you know, we go home, we maybe see, see each other during, during an event, you know, and we go home. So we, you know, lose that, that 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 essence of what you know a community is and if we have that that essence and then we would understand like brother Caffey talked about that that brotherhood that true essence of what a brotherhood is 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 you know within that family so yep all right again thanks for um great questions um tonight as always and also with the conversation that's going on in the chat too which is um you know it's always good so let's go to our closing statements right now. You know, Brother Curtis, again, thanks for being on. You have any parting words for us? I'd like to give you one more jewel for a new lodge, and this will help that lodge once it becomes an old lodge. But when you start, you need to have a lodge of young men and older men. You can't have a lodge just of young men. You can't have a lodge just of older men. You need a delicate balance within this lodge uh, because young men can do that work, can do some of that footwork. They can be attractive to other young members. Old brothers, they have that life experience and that life, that wisdom that they can impart into the you know, operation of the lodge. Every lodge should keep that delicate balance because what you will see, eventually a lodge will get to a point to where you've got 20 plus what we call gold card members. They don't pay dues anymore, but they're not bringing anybody in. 
and that lodge will eventually have to merge before whatever. So try to keep a delicate balance. Now, I've, I've also learned, and some people may get upset with me, sometimes brothers get set in their, quote, traditions. You know, that's dangerous for a lodge's survival. Egos are dangerous for a lodge's survival. Got to be willing to bring those young brothers in and allow them to do what they do. As long as they, number one, don't mess with the lodge's money too crazy and then do anything outside of the Masonic principles, let those young brothers come in and, again, feel appreciated, not tolerated, as you said uh, before, uh, Brother Jack. Let those young brothers come in because a young brother will attract another young brother faster than these gray hairs on my face will attract a young brother to come in. And that's something that is needed in all of our lodges. It's just, uh, uh, you know, I, I practice ma'at. It's uh, the principle of balance. We need balance in our lodges to continue the lodge's survival just for membership purposes. So again, brothers, I appreciate this opportunity. It has been outstanding. Thank you. I thank your viewers. I thank all the brothers I see from Moses Dixon Lodge in the comments. And uh, this has been just a great, great show. Thank you, brothers. Now, thank you, Brother Curtis. And before I let Brother Morgan and Brother Jack give their um, closing um, point, to piggyback on what you're saying, too, we, we also have to remember uh, those of us who have been in the lodge for years and came in as young men, and now we're, 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 we're getting closer and closer to that seasoned brother, we have to remember that at one point in time, we was that young brother. That's right. That didn't know. I think, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And so sometimes I think we, we just, for whatever reason, we forget. Yes. You know, we we just think we just can't, but 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 we have to remember that we were at one point in time was that young brother, and we had some positive experiences and we had some negative experiences. Mm -hmm. Do we want to? And then so going back, to what you're saying, brother Curtis, for tradition's sake, do we want to? You know, have a a, a negative, you know, treat the treat the younger brothers coming in on, from and, and give them that negativity, or do we want to break that tradition? Remember how we felt. And then be more positive to, exactly. to, to grow their experience. It's all about experiences, too. We want um, men and brothers to have positive experiences coming in the lodge. But yeah. I, that, that, that's often funny. And, and it, it's hard. It, it's a lot of the brothers that came in, you know, when I came in now, we, you know, certain positions, different things, and we're becoming those elder statesmen of the, of the lodge. And we yeah. often joke around about that because we'll start talking about, you know, a young brother that either presented a report you know certain way or degree work and then we literally have to stop ourselves and one of us have to check each other and say hey that was us yes, <laughs> exactly. that was us. Let, let, yes, let's sir. look at this from a different angle yes, you know sir. so excellent point excellent point uh brother jack closing closing uh statement sir yes sir you know it's funny that it's funny that you say that because you know uh when you talk about that brother curtis and and, and brother Caffey, you definitely have to have you know, uh, a, a brother or two, uh, or even more, who who can be that bridge between the the seasoned members and 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 the younger members. Those who can who can understand. You know, the 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 brothers in in, in my lodge, especially our print our principal officers, are what we would consider of a of a younger sort. You know, and you know they're you know considering me which i still haven't accepted that mantle yet they want to call me the, the the godfather of the lodge i said that you can't I, i'm not accepting that yet even though you know this august will be 15 years in, in it for me but like you said i do remember you know what it was like when i when i first came in so um as always to uh to our uh to our viewers uh to our family we thank you for the greatest gift that you could have given us, which is uh, your time, because that's something that we cannot get back. Right. Um, but the Curtis, this was uh, um, out outstanding. I, I, I enjoy it and I enjoyed it so much. And I definitely want information um, on your book as well, um, because I, I do want to get a copy uh, of your book as well. Um, uh, hopefully uh, to, to those who have watched you, you know, understand what it, what it means, not just to, uh, not just to build a, to, a new lodge, but to start something new. Yes. Uh, anything, anything new um, that you are getting ready to start, whatever that is in, in in your life, you have to understand that there that there is going to be a process involved. 
Um, and, and it's going to have it's going to have good times. It's going to have bad times. It's going to have its ups and downs. But you have to remember uh, what what that goal is. And, and, and like the like the big, great poem says, you know, rest if you must, but don't you quit. You know, and, and everybody is not going to see the vision of what, you know, what you want to start of what that new thing that, that you're going to start. Um, but I tell you to continue to work your continue to work your vision until their eyesight is corrected. Um, I want to give uh, a, a quick shout out to uh, Worship Master Gabriel Mitchell and the Brothers of Jephthah Lodge number 89, worst, most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of New York, uh, to Brother uh, Wilbur Green, uh, worshipful Master of the Who, the You uh, uh, in, uh, in New York. Um, we uh, they um, they had me home last week uh, to uh, give a presentation, and it was a fantastic weekend. Um, I thank the uh, the brothers of, of the first district. Just thank the brothers of New York. All five boroughs that came out, they showed up and showed out. Thank you so much. Thank you to the brothers of the U for bestowing honorary membership uh, to me. I really enjoyed um, being home and can't wait to uh, go home to go home again. And quick shout out to uh, our brother and friend who couldn't make it on tonight, brother Dave Gillarm. He is in mourning because the Knicks lost today. Um, you know, we, I, I, calf, I wasn't gonna let that go. Um, <laughs> you know, we know that they're, the we, know that they're deep. The Listen, we know that they are deep with, they're deep in the playoffs and we congratulate them for being deep in the playoffs, but they lost today and he should have still been on. But, uh, <laughs> until, until, uh, next month, um, you know, with actually, you, you know, continue, uh, we'll pray that you continue to go in the, in the way that God lead, needs you to go in. And we will see you next month. God bless. Sure, indeed. Brother Morgan. Well, man, uh, again, I want to thank my good friend and brother, Troy Curtis, for accepting our invitation. It's always an honor to be here on the Prince Hall Think Tank. Um, brother uh, brother Curtis, um, I'm going to go a little off script because I got something here. I don't think, I don't know that I've shown you. But I got something, something here I want to show you and, and, and the viewers here. Uh, brother Curtis, do you know, have you seen this picture before? Yes, I have, good brother. Okay. So yes, so sir. this, for those who don't know, this mm -hmm. is none other than Moses Dixon, uh, the man for whom uh, brother Troy Curtis's lodge is named after. Uh, this brother was a pioneer for what Prince Hall Masonry, uh, particularly in the, in the Midwest, was all about. Um, I, I, we can, I can see very clearly that uh, having a beard uh, was something that he had, and the brothers of Moses Dixon are keeping that tradition alive. Ah, uh, yes, we discovered you know, it. That's why. Right? Yeah, there exactly. you go. There you <laughs> exactly. Go. But, but, I, but I wanted to put this picture up just to say that to show that you know you never know, okay, the impact that you're going to have on future That's generations. Right. That's right. Past past Grandmaster Moses Dixon did a lot of work in Prince Hall Masonry at a time when most people of African descent in this country were actually still being held in bondage. And he risked his life for this organization to spread as well as for uh, the gospel to AME church and the, uh, the number of other organizations that, uh, that he was in that brother Curtis highlighted earlier, but his work, even though his body has is, is, is since long since passed on and he's laid down his work, his working tools, uh, his work is still continuing through in spirit through Moses Dixon Lodge. Hmm. So, so let's be mindful that the things that we're doing today can have a ripple effect down to the future in ways that we still would not, we still cannot fathom. He probably had no idea that anyone would be talking on a thing called the internet, putting his picture up, showing and talking about him. But yet here we are. Yes, sir. So, so, so the same way that that happened with him, the same thing is going on right now with this, with this lodge, with all the other new lodges and chapters that are being established around the world. Some of whom we may not know of yet. Right. But they're, but they're doing the work. So, so I want to encourage everyone here uh, who listens to this episode, whether you're live or you're watching it on a replay, uh, to remember that, 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 that the, the actions we take today do have a ripple effect through, through time. Um, so I just wanted to kind of say that um, as uh, a last little parting, parting words, I do want to thank uh, Most Worshipful Grandmaster Michael Wiggins and the jurisdiction of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge, New Jersey, for also welcoming me home. It was it was homecoming season for, for myself and Brother Jack because he got to go to New York and I got to go to New Jersey. Uh, I got to attend uh, the jurisdiction of New Jersey's um, uh, anniversary gala 
uh, up there in Cherry Hill, and I had a wonderful time. So I definitely want to say thank you uh, to, to them for hosting me, and I had a, a magnificent time while I was there. And, and lastly, um, I do want to um, thank um, Brother – well, I, well, let me say this. I got to thank Brother Curtis in the jurisdiction of Missouri because I will be coming out there this summer uh, for you all scholarship banquet. So we'll be continuing this conversation uh, forward. And I thank your most worshipful grandmaster and, and his staff for, uh, for, for working with me. So I'm looking forward to coming out there to St. Louis. Um, but lastly, I want to also make sure I, that I thank Brother Jack. Um, as some of you all know, or maybe you noticed on this show today, myself and Brother Jack are wearing matching shirts because I recently became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And I wanted to thank Brother Jack because he was aware of this, you know, early on that I, I was pursuing that. And I, and I remember something he said to me very early on when I told him I was just kind of curious and just kind of looking at some of that, some of that history. He said, okay, well, you got the history, but what are you going to do with it? And, and I, and that stuck with me because brother Jack has been a brother who has always been faithful and, and a good friend in the staff third. And, and, and I wanted to thank him publicly for uh, supporting me through that particular uh, uh, journey as well. And hopefully I made him proud and also, I can't, I can't forget past Grandmaster Shelton Prescott uh, in New Jersey as well. But, but Brother Jack, I really wanted to thank you personally for uh, for supporting me, for making sure I knew what I was supposed to know and whatnot. And and, uh, and I think the, I think when I crossed, I was so tired. I think you might have been more excited than I was that day. But I, but I want to thank you so much. And I will not forget that uh, the first Alpha Phi Alpha shirt that I ever got, the first little gift package I got came from Brother Jack. And I, and I, I just wanted to thank you so much because that meant so much to me. So, uh, right. so thank you. God is good. You, you're more than welcome. You know, it's just, it's just about, you know, passing it down again, you know, welcome to the house. And, um, and, uh, real quick, I would be, I would be remiss. I really would be remiss if I did not give a shout out. I'm um, giving a shout out to, um, uh, going back home. Uh, got to give a shout out to, uh, worship master Lloyd Eason on uh, the brothers of Dork Lodge number 53 in Hempstead, Long Island and the Phyllis fourth district. Uh, that Saturday, they took me out. We spent the day out at the lodge. Um, uh, truly enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, Brother uh, Anthony Marshall, for taking me around all weekend. Of course, got to give a shout out to uh, the Honorable Gregory R. Smith Jr., the most worshipful uh, Grand Master uh, of New York. Had some chance to uh, uh, talk to him and, and hang out with him for a little while. And Brother Curtis, I got to give a shout out to uh, to your most worshipful Grand Master, the Honorable uh, uh, Lamont Mitchell. Uh, he and my he and I have crossed paths uh, uh, multiple times. Very very good and, and, and knowledgeable brother. So uh, again, thank you to 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 all those brothers who uh, continue to inspire me to do uh, what I need to do. And, and again, James, uh, thank you is not necessary. This is what we're supposed to do. This is what uh, brotherhood is all about. And again, welcome to the house. Uh, thank you, brothers. And again, thank you, thank you to our. Uh... Our, our, our viewers, I expect a special um, thank you to Brother Curtis for joining us and imparting the wisdom that you've, um, you know, imparted tonight. Um, you know, we, we've had a oh, wait, great wait, wait, Brother Kathy, Brother Kathy, I'm almost forgetting something. Yes, sir. I was able to prove that you're a real person because you actually, because we actually <laughs> got to look up. Yes! Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. And... I've, 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 you know what? Thank you for that too. I, I think I posted something on our Facebook group, but I too want to publicly thank um, Brother James Morgan. You know, some of you may know my daughter will be attending um, the illustrious Howard University in the fall. Uh, Acceptance Students Day was uh, a couple weeks ago. My wife and um, my wife and I, along with my daughter, flew down to D.C. Uh, I, and and called James up. Now again, like I said in the Facebook group. So the ongoing story has been, you know, for the past, you know, since 2015 with the think tank and our various guests and, 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 and co-hosts and different things, you know, they've all met each other in person, but I've never met any of them, you know, in person before. Um, had a few close encounters, you know, me and, me and Brother Jack was supposed to hook up, um, you know, at a convention I was at last, uh, last year in Charlotte, but it didn't happen. Uh, and then I went to D.C. What about a month ago, I think, for a tour, didn't hook up with James. So I knew this time, like, look, if I didn't hook up with James, I, I wouldn't be on this show tonight because I couldn't live that down. So, no, I, 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 I did. Uh, we did link up. And as, as, as many of you um, that have met James Morgan for the first time probably experienced, I did not realize James was as tall 
as he was um, when when I, I, I you know when we finally met, and he remarked that he didn't realize I was as short as I was <laughs> when we met. But no, it was all around um, great time. Um, he showed us, um, you know, and gave us provided us some great information about Howard University. And I think more important than that, as a father, he made me feel real, real comfortable in sending my daughter six hours away to school, knowing that someone, um, a brother, um, that's close that will I'll be able to call, and if anything happens, and he can check in on her and everything. That literally, it it made me feel at ease. So, brother, I thank you for that. Not a problem at all, and she's got a whole couple. She's got several hundred uncles uh, down here uh, as well. So, so anything and, and aunties for that matter. So she'll she'll be perfectly fine. And I'm just glad the same way that Damien uh, uh, welcomed me to the House of Alpha. I want to welcome your daughter to be in a bison. Uh, you know, celebrating uh, uh, th that wonderful tradition from 1867 on down. I'm I I, I couldn't be more excited. Yeah, true indeed. So, um, great show. I don't want to belabor the uh, evening. Thank you all for joining us. And, and I think, you know, I want to leave again with what all the brothers said tonight. Um, and, and then I, I allude to a, a lot you know, in and of itself as far as being proud of the history and the shoulders that we stand upon, but realizing that we need to make sure our shoulders are strong enough to support those folks that will be standing on our shoulders as well you know so keep that in mind uh, again thanks for joining us tonight we hope you've gained a little insight and we hope you join us for future broadcasts of the prince all think tank have a good evening and remember let's teach masonry in our lodges good evening